sold toys and candy to uh, people uh, coming in the trains. And um, Jay mentioned uh, Hugo, which I had a, a lot of fun working on. You can see here that uh, we took a lot of care to recreate the story of George Villiers in the film Hugo. You can see an actual photograph of his uh, toy store and then how it was uh, recreated for the film. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, special effects in silent movies. And this is not a definitive um, catalog of, of everything that's happened in the silent era because a lot of that information has been uh, lost, lost history. But we do know a few things, and there are some things that I've discovered along the way, which uh, I'm going to share with you tonight. So here's George Villiers. He has set up his camera at the uh, Paris Opera Square, and he's starting to shoot um, a scene uh, when he notices that there's a Madeleine Bastille omnibus passing him by. And while this happens, his camera jams. It uh, breaks, and he has to uh, correct it, rethread it, and when he projects the film the next day, the omnibus changes into a hearse, followed by mourners. So this was the idea of what he called the, uh, the trick cut, or the substitution splice, that led him to uh, create visual effects. Did he realized that he could stop time with the camera and manipulate it to create fantastic visual effects for part of his movies. So an example of that is uh, this early film with uh, GM Dancy, where he's going to uh, make her disappear. And this is a recreation of what would normally have been the stage performance. And you can see he places a piece of paper underneath the chair to show the audience that there's no trap doors involved, because that's how the effect would have been done originally. And if you look at it very carefully as he covers his subject with the uh, blanket, a little bit is left of her dress. You can see just a little bit there as she disappears. So that is the substitution splice, creating visual effects. You might say that it was done by accident. It's sort of what we call serendipity, that he had this problem with the camera, which led him to the discovery of this technique, which we used many, many times in his fantastic films. So whereas, say, uh, the Lumieres were holding a uh, mirror to reality in more of a documentary form, Meliès was interested in a window into the fantastic. Here he is again in his um, glass studio, and you can see he's painting uh, a large backing, which is going to be part of his sets. And this is uh, <clears throat> around the time that he's doing uh, a trip to the moon. You can see some objects, like the uh, Earth sphere is going to be a prop in this movie. And um, here is the result of that. And you can see this is all you know, the beginning of narrative film and fantasy storytelling. Everything is here that you need to know. The astronomers are planning their trip to the moon. There's a blackboard that's going to show you what's going to happen. And his set has been created uh, through a process of art direction, meaning that he's designed it and painted it to create it versus something that was a found location. It's something that he created through uh, special effects. Toward the end of Millier's uh, career reign, his uh, glass studio eventually fell into disrepair. And these were some uh, photographs that were taken by Henri uh, La from the uh, Paris Francaise just before the uh, studio was destroyed. So, a little bit on Hugo. We had the chance to recreate the Millier studio. And uh, Dante Ferretti, the production designer, made a very exact copy based on Millier's uh, sketches and plans of his studio. Uh, the one problem was is that while it was built outside, it was built in London, uh, only during overcast days. They couldn't find a good day to shoot. And so all the footage has this kind of flat uh, lighting to it, which emotionally was not effective in what we were trying to do 
as far as create the magic of the Millie Studio. So this is something, what I do is I would then get this shot from the director and we would say, well, how can we make this more fantastic? And even though it was a real construction, we use computer graphics to essentially relight the studio. We put the effect of sunlight on the glass, bright blue sky with white puffy clouds, being able to see what's going on inside the studio, making it much more of a magical experience for the audience. And this is the final shot. There's even a line in the film that says, this is where we make uh, your dreams come true. So it wasn't the most difficult shot to do, but probably the most important, you know, for the, for the picture. Give you a little idea of what kind of goes into creating some of the scenes of Hugo. Hugo is done in stereo, which means that we had to create an image for the right or the left eye. Uh, you can see here that the camera is uh, rendering what the eye would see. And then we have to recreate Paris in the appropriate time period, which also has the stereo effect. Ultimately, a shot like this is pretty much completely created as an illusion. And this is the only part of the live action set we had, which is uh, George Meunier's Walking the Streets of Paris at Night. So, getting back a little bit to the early aspects of visual effects, this is a biograph film that uh, Deep W. Griffith made called uh, Those Awful Hats. And I'm including it tonight because, quite frankly, I have no idea how this was, was done. Maybe, <laughs> maybe somebody out there knows a little bit more about this film. But it was basically made as a public service message for uh, women who would come to a movie theater and would have very large hats so that people couldn't see what was going on behind them. So you can see this is very, very early compositing. It almost doesn't work because a biograph camera used friction instead of, instead of uh, perforations to register its film. So there's a lot of weaving back and forth. We know this is a special effect shot because you couldn't have photographed a projection with the camera stock at the time it had to be a composite. But for the, for the gag to work, people have to walk in front of the screen. And that means that there's a composite method going on here, or a traveling map method is what we call. And this is years before optical printers. We don't see optical printers until the 1920s and the uh, late 1920s. Here's uh, Max Sennett uh, in the foreground. Uh, that happens to be a character in the film. And, uh, of course, there's a comedic aspect to it going on. So, now it's going to get to be very surrealistic, and you'll see why in just a moment. Uh, kind of shockingly strange, in fact. I'm going to have a few more people coming in to, uh, to obscure our view. Can everybody see the screen okay tonight? No problems. It just keeps building. happy or horrified by what just happened, but as you can see, the idea was that a digger claw comes in and solves the problem. composite something over a different image was developed by 
um, Frank D. Williams, and this is a picture of Frank Williams um, during Kid Auto Races, which also happens to be Chaplin's first movie where he uh, created his tramp character. But Frank created a what we call a traveling man effect shot. And if you were a producer in the um, late 20s, early 30s, and you looked through the various trade magazines, you would come through an advertisement like this, which would say, if you hire um, Frank Williams, at the Williams process, he can do these composites for you. He had, had a technique here that was patented so that if you wanted to use a composite shot, you would have to go work at his lab. And you can see it used to be on 8111 South Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles. I've actually been there, there's nothing there now. <laughs> I was hoping, you know, maybe a building, but nothing is left of his original studio. So a great example of the Williams process being used in silent movies is um, um, Marnell's uh, Sunrise in 1927. And I came across this still. And again, a lot of this is my conjecture. You know, there's a lot of uh, things written down or people talking about how certain effects were done because a lot of these things were kind of considered trade secrets. But I've been looking at this photograph that was in the collection of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. I can see that there are uh, two grips holding uh, a wooden frame with black goods stretched from it. And what they're doing is that they're, they're walking with the characters uh, during the shot. And so from the camera viewpoint, you can see the camera's on a dolly. It's about to follow them. From the camera viewpoint, we are able to isolate our two characters against black. And so this is the start of the Williams process. So by this time, we are starting to see uh, early optical printers. And just quite simply, what an optical printer is, is a camera that photographs the film inside a projector. But instead of a lens being on that projector, the camera is just photographing the film. And through a process of stencils, it's able to take what it wants from one piece of film and composite it and add it to a fresh composite film made of multiple elements. And so in this case, we go through the process of making a reverse map of what was photographed before uh, with the grips and the black. And then optically, you can make an opposite of that. And then with a new background, composite your characters in like a jigsaw puzzle into a scene. And so let's take a look at this sequence from uh, the movie. And the idea here is that the, the two young couples uh, are in the city, they're in love with each other, and they have this sort of magical experience together that's very dreamlike uh, right before they are shocked back to the reality of what it's like to be in the big city. <coughs> Stills, much more so than his contemporaries. But 
there's a beautiful sequence in the beginning of City Lights that establishes uh, Chaplin in a big city. And uh, all this is, is a fabrication. It's all created on the back lot of his studio. You can see the sequence. of this uh, star power today. This is at the mega star level. <laughs> you know, the movie stars don't quite have this amazing uh, popularity. So, Chaplin, in that sequence that you saw that was uh, filmed in a, in, a, in a busy urban environment in the city, he couldn't actually go downtown in Los Angeles, which would have uh, Pershing Square or something very much like that. He would have to create everything because he would be totally mobbed when people would realize that a Chaplin film was being made. So, I was looking at these photographs, um, again, in the archives, and I just, again, behind the scenes photos, I happen to notice that if you look up in the corners, there's some little windows, like little building pieces, up in the air, and I wasn't really quite sure why. I started to go through some of these photographs and realized that a lot of this is going to be an extension of the set to make it a city. And so it's a jumbled mess from these off-camera photographs, but from the position of the camera, everything lines up perfectly to extend uh, the foreground into a big city. But if you look really closely, I don't know if we can see my point up here. That's a, that's a little bit of a mismatch, where the camera that took this photograph is not exactly the camera that is going to photograph the scene. So we call this a hanging miniature shot, and this is exactly what it means. We have a miniature, which is placed in, on the top of the frame that extends the set to add value, production value to the scene. And so um, the camera, since it uh, has only one eye, we dispense with depth, and the camera doesn't know if an object is 10 feet away or 100 feet away, and so you can change the scale of objects and bring them closer to the camera and make it appear that you've created a large scene that doesn't really exist. So just getting back to our uh, scene from uh, City Lights, we can kind of see that, that uh, the top of the frame has been added 
uh, using this technique. Pretty undetectable as, as an illusion. So another technique that comes from the silent era is what we call the glass shot. And this is a, this is a, a Warner Brothers identity card for Bud Thackeray, who's uh, employed as a glass artist, rather unique title. Uh, but this is what he would do is uh, paint on glass and then combine that, those glass paintings with live action scenes. <clears throat> and it just so happens that uh, Bud Thackeray, who's behind the camera, visited the USC campus. And uh, I teach a, a course there and came across this photograph of Bud Thackeray, who was the glass artist who, uh, who painted these scenes, which I'm about to show you from, from Chaplin. So um, just to kind of go over what a glass shot is, is that again, the, the camera shoots through a piece of glass where a, a, a painting, a photorealistic painting is rendered and then combines it with the background to create a new composite image. Uh, in this case, a castle on a hill. And again, as long as the camera has enough depth of field to keep the glass in focus and the background in focus, uh, the illusion can become uh, pretty much undetectable. So there's a brilliant example of it in uh, modern times with uh, Chaplin uh, roller skating. Uh, and uh, you can see that the gag was that he was never quite aware that he was about to fall off of the uh, right without the railings here. Um, but from the point of view of the camera, if we could pull back and simulate what you might see, we have Bud Thackeray's glass painting, the camera shooting through it, and the background then combined together. This is also what we call a uh, Jeopardy shot. Uh, the idea being that you know the uh, character is uh, in danger of uh, either falling off a cliff or <coughs> might be killed in some way, but in actuality, uh, the character is perfectly safe, and the illusion is created through visual effects. But still, even when you know you know that it's a trick, it's still hugely effective. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the technology of the camera. This is, uh, Chaplin used exclusively a camera called the Bell and Howell 2709 camera. And uh, here, here's a picture of it. And what, what the 2709 did was it was a, a precise camera that was made uh, to a specification like a Swiss watch. It could expose the film uh, in such a way that it would be uh, consistently in the same place every frame. So there wouldn't be this characteristic weave or movement of the various elements that would be composited together as in, um, um, as in the Biograph camera. This allowed special effects to go forward because you could then make illusions where things aren't moving in relationship to each other. And then eventually Chaplin put motors on his 27-line camera at some point as well. So it was a very versatile camera. But um, another uh, sequence I want to show you from, uh, from Chaplin is um, the lion cage sequence. And uh, this is from a film called The Circus where uh, he gets trapped inside of a lion cage
and it looked like you were shooting through a pair of binoculars. So there were all these accessories that came with this camera. Camera, and that effect would be achieved. We'll see what's up. We have another one here. It's kind of fun to see some of these. The uh, classic uh, keyhole shot. So if there was a lecherous person looking through a keyhole, perhaps somebody in dressing, you could have that. There's a star, which was actually used uh, in another shot for the circus. But additionally, with these masks, the interesting thing about it is uh, that they have a whole bunch of masks that are set up for doing uh, in camera split screens. And what's going on is that these are. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to be able to photograph part of the scene. So, let's take a look at how the aperture down I think we've got here. We're going to rotate the lens around so that we can see inside the camera aperture. Can everybody hear this? Okay. So that you can see the film plane. That's that gray square inside the aperture. By putting the split screen mask in, we're ready to photograph only half the frame. So this might be photographing Charlie Chaplin on the left hand side. After that's completed, the camera would be rewound and the aperture mask split would be placed deeper into the shot so that only the right hand side would be exposed. It's protecting what was previously exposed on the left hand side, but the right hand side is ready for a second exposure. Then once that is photographed, in this case, photography of the lion, the two are combined together into a new exposure creating the scene. Okay, so the ring is uh, uh, home. Um, notice also that this is all very carefully designed that the lion cage just happens to have a series of wainscoting behind it, which provides a whole bunch of, of lines that help the split be hidden, as well as the bars of the cage itself. So first we have the line, which would be photographed, and then the camera can be rewound, and the area of the line is protected while Charlie Chaplin is photographed separately. And so now he can do this very dangerous shot of going to lion and, and doing it in perfect safety because you never know what would happen if you tried to do something like that for real. Okay, so um, moving on to Harold Lloyd. Uh, Harold Lloyd's safety last, and I think there were some uh, earlier Harold Lloyd films at the festival to me. The safety last, absolutely my favorite. Um, this sort of iconic image of uh, Harold Lloyd hanging from a clock uh, over a busy street in Los Angeles is iconic. Uh, this image is sort of um, uh, very much a part of the silent era as, as a classic image that uh, everybody has seen and knows about. Let's uh, take a look of a short clip from, from Safety Last. Now, um, before I show this, the establishing shots were, were, uh, were Harold Lloyd is apparently climbing the side of the building was done by a stuntman named Harvey Perry. And we know that because uh, Kevin Brownlow interviewed him and uh, Harvey said that he did the stunt work for Harold Lloyd in this sequence. And that's fine for the establishing shots where you can't tell it's Harold Lloyd climbing, but obviously some sort of camera illusion was gonna have to be created that actually showed Lloyd in shots. So let's watch a very short clip to set this up.
right, so um, before we get into how that was done, here is a photograph from uh, uh, Lookout Below, which was directed by Hal Roach. That's Hal Roach there on the left. And they realized that while they were uh, filming Los Angeles, that if they got up on top of this, uh, what's called a Hill Street Tunnel, you can see the railing of the Hill Street Tunnel at the bottom of the frame, you could build a set. And if you didn't show uh, the ground directly underneath the camera, it would appear that the uh, actors and subjects were way up in the air. And you can see the result of the uh, scene on the right, um, able to sort of create this sort of feeling of great height. So we knew that, that Lloyd had built a partial set on the top of some building. And this is my friend John Bankston. And we found the building, which is 908 South Broadway in downtown Los Angeles. And the owners of the building were nice enough to let us go up on the roof and figure out by seeing the buildings in the distance that um, this was indeed a facade or partial set that was sitting on top of a roof. And to sort of further show you how this might have uh, looked on the day that they were photographing it, perspective, of course, has to be carefully uh, lined up. But you can see from the position of the camera and the rooftop, we're photographing the partial set and the background together, uh, where Lloyd is relatively safe because he's performing on top of a mattress. Per se, because he could fall and fly off anyway, but uh, he didn't do that. And so uh, I call this uh, 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 trick danger shots. I, again, there isn't really a vocabulary for it, but I think trick danger sounds pretty good. And so uh, there is a whole genre of using this technique that Hal Roach came up with. All right, so um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, winning of uh, Barbara Worth, which is going to be the uh, beautifully restored closing night film. Uh, this is, you know, kind of considered one of the early disaster pictures, you know, where the there's a, a melodrama and then uh, a disaster happens at the end which sort of corrects wrongs and things like that. So um, this ended up being a very popular series. And of course, we're still looking at disaster films today. You know, San Andreas with The Rock was uh, the latest one. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a genre that remains popular to this day. Uh, we have our heroes here, uh, Clyde Cook, Ronald Coleman, and Gary Cooper. Um, Ronald Coleman, it's sort of interesting to see Ronald Coleman in a silent film because he has such a wonderful voice that we don't get to hear it. And of course, this is also Gary Cooper's first film. Uh, he was discovered uh, by the director, Henry King, when another actor wasn't able to make it to location. And they gave Gary Cooper a chance and uh, became his, uh, his start of becoming a major a motion picture star. This is uh, Velma Banke and the director Henry King on the set. And uh, on the back is, uh, on the left is cinematographer George Barnes. Um, uh, Greg Tolan is rumored to be uh, George Barnes' assistant, but that doesn't seem to be a picture of Greg Tolan there, so maybe uh, he came on another day. But um, this is the crew that uh, photographed the film. They found this location, which was out at uh, Black, what's called Nevada's Black Rock Desert, and uh, it's a stark and desolate landscape that was perfect for the film's setting. Uh, but the point of the film is that there's going to be this giant flood, and there is absolutely no water available to do anything like that. So uh, special effects were going to have to be used, and that was uh, created by uh, visual effects ex expert Ned Pan who uh, ended up working for Corda many years on, on many classic films. To kind of appreciate uh, Barbara Worth, we're gonna sort of jump forward on a few of Ned's other films. Uh, he has sort of a characteristic approach to how he likes to photograph miniatures. This is a film that he did called The Lottery Bride, it has uh, Jeanette McDonald in it. And it's a scene where they're welcoming a Zeppelin coming uh, let me just show you this little clip of the Zeppelin arriving. Of course, this is a miniature, and you can see how it cuts with the live actors as they uh, observe this uh, Zeppelin coming in for landing. Okay, so 
you can see that what uh, Ned is doing is adding all these miniature people to the base of the Zeppelin. And they're little models, and they have little strings on them, so they move a little bit, um, because it's very difficult to combine uh, live action into the miniature with this kind of scene. And so this is a characteristic that he started to develop when he shot miniatures. He was always looking for ways to put these little people in to give it scale and to make it look big. And if the shots are fairly quick, it's something that was a perfectly acceptable illusion. Um, another film he worked on was uh, Corda's uh, Things to Come, which uh, of course is one of the masterpieces of science fiction. And in this scene, uh, we're gonna see some more of Ned Band's miniature work. Uh, what happens here is that the, um, the people of the city uh, who are upset with technology are trying to uh, destroy the space gun because they are against the exploration of outer space. And so here is the uh, climatic scene uh, showing the space gun. Again, this is sort of coming full circle to George Melies' version of the space gun and exploring uh, the other planets. <laughs> scrutinizing this in a way that is uh, a little bit unfair because we're looking exactly for these miniature people right here. But you can see how uh, these shots really could not have been created in another way uh, based on the technology they have available. So now going back to the winning of Margaret's work, we're going to see Ned Mann's first use of this technique that he's known for. Um, now these are some clips that are uh, from the DVD, so they're not going to look nearly as great as the restored version that you're about to see uh, later in the week. But you can see that there's a nice scale of the water coming in and destroying these uh, miniature buildings. But most of the shots are separate. I mean, you're either looking at a visual effects shot, a miniature, or you're looking at the, uh, the people running from the, from the uh, walls of water out on location. And so uh, in a shot like this, you know, you're not really seeing the people that we might want to see. So there's a, they feel like sort of two separate worlds sometimes, even though with fast editing and cutting together, it's still pretty impressive. And there's good scale in the miniature here. Things are all in focus. Things look like they're actually happening all at the same time. And now Ned's going to have the first use of his idea of miniature horses with buggies and people tied in to the flood. And there you go. So you can see a shot like that pulls everything together and makes the sequence work. So uh, I'm not going to show you what happens here because I don't want to ruin the film for you. So um, we're going to fade away. <laughs> All right. So um, just a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, Meg DeWall, the Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, Sergey Bromberg from Monster Films. Those awful hats from the Library of Congress. That's a paper print that they preserved. Nancy Kaufman from the George Eastman House. Uh, Frigo Mangini for Special Effects Research. John Bankston, my friend who found the location uh, for um, Safety Last with me. And I heard that there might be some question and answers. So, thank you. Are there, I'm assuming there's a microphone in the house? I see an usher with a microphone. Check up. Uh, Please, Mama. Check. See. Uh, okay. If you don't have any questions, that's okay. I covered everything. Okay, we got a few. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, only a little question is about the camera. Um, um, in this kind of effects, like William shot, Matt shot, uh, 
it was always or all, almost always made with the melon hammer, hammer? Did you say that? Mitchell hammer? I don't know. Yes. So, um, Milliers had very crude cameras, um, biograph cameras, I mentioned, uh, didn't have perforation, it used friction, so it was very difficult to keep the image uh, steady while it was being photographed. And so if the film is not photographed in the same place every time, when you try to add different elements into it, they're just shaking around, and so it's not an effective illusion. So the Bell and Al 2709 camera that I showed that Chaplin used was precise enough uh, for visual effects work and that really led the door open to doing things like split screens and things where you could create undetectable illusions because there was no technical problem with it. Um, there was also the Mitchell camera, which came a little bit later. Uh, uh, Sunrise had Mitchell's and Bell and Al cameras. Both those cameras were excellent cameras. They were the workhorses of the silent era but they were also precise enough that they could do excellent visual effects work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah, I know. Casper's there too, just a moment. First here. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I would like to uh, you can refer to Buster Keaton, since he was one of the greatest um, the mechanics of films and making tricks, like in the short playhouse, and of course, uh, Sherlock Jr. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Buster Keaton also, so of the three big comedian, uh, uh, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, Chaplin, I did leave Keaton out, and I apologize for that. <laughs> it was mostly for time. But um, Keaton also used the vocabulary of visual effects for telling stories. And I think, I think the point here is that when we sort of say, today we sort of think of a visual effects picture as something, say, Marvel would do with a film that has lots of visual effects and it. it's known as a visual effects picture. These filmmakers were using visual effects in service to telling their stories. So they weren't visual effects per se that were attracting attention to themselves. They were part of a process of expanding the canvas of cinema so that they could create compelling stories. And so that's why we sort of call them invisible effects, and I think they're the most interesting to talk about. Hi, I'm with the Biograph Project, and I can speak to those awful hats. Okay. Um, thanks to the very generous Mayor Foundation grant, we were able to scan the original paper print material, which you didn't have. Um, what you showed was a MoMA restoration that was done for Griffith Centennial. You can see the film within the film already had nitrate. And they did the traveling mask oh, in the dear. 70s. When you study the film, and we've, uh, Ben Salve of Film Preservation Society is finishing up its restoration now. Once, once the first movie ends, and we've got the footage of them filming way far back and batting it out, uh -huh. um, you can see Billy Mixer sitting on the side. Once the first film ends, the piano player stops playing, and all the action that happens in front of the screen is happening in front of the blank screen because uh -huh. it's between the shows. Okay. And the audience is coming in. And for years, everybody, including myself, fought there were two films within the film, and somehow um, Biograph or Bitzer had figured out a traveling map. They didn't. Okay. It was MoMA. Well, I, 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 I of course love MoMA, but I have to say the archivist confused me greatly. Yes, they did, and we're happy to share the original material with you for your uh, I have, And this is why I'm coming to Port None, because now <laughs> I can learn something from the audience. Well, Biograph nerd, yes. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, in the modern times sequence with Jacqueline doing the roller skating, the camera turns to follow him. What happens with the glass plate then? Okay. Well, um, it's a little bit more of a technical question, which is why I didn't include it. But to answer your question, 
uh, when a camera is set on the what we call the nodal point, and the nodal point is the position in the lens when the light rays cross over, and when you pan and tilt, when the camera is on the nodal point, there is no parallax or perspective shift between the background and the foreground. It's as if you're just pushing the frame up or down or, or across. And so by placing the camera on the nodal point, you can pan on the glass and it doesn't shift to the background. And so uh, they were able to set up the camera that way so that the camera could pan and uh, follow Chaplin. And of course, being able to do that adds a lot to that shot because you, you kind of think, well, it has to be a static shot, but no, the camera's panning and following Chaplin. So it's a very effective illusion that way. Thank you. I have a mark here, I'm not sure I'm supposed to stand here. Thank you, sorry. I was going to ask exactly the same question that this gentleman just asked, but so just to follow up on that, are you saying that the, the point where the camera pans is not kind of in the middle of the head of the camera, it's directly underneath the lens? Yes, it's, it's usually near the iris, but it's in a different position for every lens. Uh, and it's basically where the light rays flip over, uh, where, they, where it's from upside down to, uh, you know, to normal orientation. And what you can do when you, if you want to set up a camera like that, you can just simply, um, if you're on a uh, uh, pan and tilt head, as you pan, if you put two subjects closer or further away, you just keep moving it till they don't shift in perspective. It just takes a little time to set up, but it allows you to pan and tilt off of something that would be in the foreground without it shifting to the background. Again, thanks for such a, a great uh, presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the history of the glass shot. As far as I know, it was invented by Norman Dawn. Is that right? Yes, uh, Norman Dawn is credited with uh, the glass shot. Um, he he uh, made an extensive journal. Uh, he also started as a still photographer, and he uh, had examples that predate cinema were used it in still photography with 8x10 cameras to change the scene. So uh, glass shots are credited with Norman Don, and uh, he did a series called California Missions, where he restored all the missions of California as a documentary and a travel log. He had a very long career uh, and um, uh, probably created the glass shot. Certainly the most uh, documentation we have is from Norman Don's workbook which is uh, preserved by the uh, Texas University. They have his uh, memoirs and you can read about it. And he does little sketches explaining uh, how he came up with the process. Now, I would just like to give a little tribute to one kind of special effects you did not address, which is based on animation and dedicated to Willis O'Brien mostly and he would done the way they would mix animated stop motion material which at the time was perfect illusion and live action. I think there was a, a breakthrough yeah. and it happened in the 20s with uh, Lost World and so on. So that's just to mention their name in your presentation. You're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, on my next one, I'll introduce the Lost World to please you, Serge. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, animation, the idea of creating uh, monsters with people started with the Lost World, that's another uh, innovation that happened in the silent era, and we're still seeing pictures with uh, dinosaurs eating people, so it goes way back uh, to the lost world. In your presentation, which I enjoyed thoroughly, the, you showed the different mat uh, plates that you could insert in the Bell and Howell, I believe. Mm -hmm. Were those created by Bell and Howell for this type of process, or were they created by Chaplin or some of the other filmmakers? And secondarily, did any of the camera companies create things specifically based on what the needs were of the filmmakers, or was it just purely the filmmakers driving those effects? 
The, um, the masks that were in the Bell and Hell camera were a series of accessories that you could buy separately. And that's why it had like the keyhole mat and uh, various things like that. So that before you know optical printing, where you might do that in post-production, they actually placed that mask during photography. The binoculars is a famous one. But no, those were a set of accessories that came with the camera, as well as ways to do split screens. The Mitchell camera had a little different uh, technique. They actually had some little knobs that you could turn on the side of the camera that would bring a mask in. But um, early cameras uh, were made to do this kind of work, and uh, all the filmmakers of the silent era were fully using the technology that they had available to them to make their movies. We have a question. Eventually, someone's going to ask me something I can't answer. <laughs> Thank you again. But uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, some kind of visual effects we did you don't mention about. Mm -hmm. But for me, as a completely amateur, uh, things it may be useful. Uh, the question about the mirrors, they are used in that age of the cinema? Yes. Uh, well, the expression, it's all done with mirrors, uh, does have. Uh, an application for uh, early visual effects movies. There's a process called the shift hunting process, uh, which was used extensively in um, uh, Germany uh, on things like Metropolis, where they put a, a glass mirror in front of the camera and they cut out the reflective part so the camera could shoot through a uh, background and then the reflection could bring in a model or a matte painting or a miniature of some kind. That was another technique. That, that was, um, uh, again, a lot of the different techniques are based on what the filmmakers were most comfortable using and what they felt was the best way to create an illusion. But uh, yes, there was the Shifton process, which was uh, Eugene Shifton created. It was a cameraman uh, who worked uh, in Germany on things to come. And, and uh, the, all those films over there. I will put that in my next lecture as well, so thank you. <laughs> when does uh, rear projection come in? Was that uh, uh, in the silent era at all, or did it not come in until after sound had started? Yeah, the rear projection came in more during the sound era. They, they tried it, but the problem, of course, is that you have to keep the projector in sync with the camera. So the camera um, ha uh, shutter has to be open when the projector is open, or you'll get this sort of darkening of the image because the shutter's in the way. So they really needed to connect those two things mechanically. Interesting, the, the process, uh, the uh, Williams process, and there's also another process called the Dunning process, which came slightly after, which were those compositing processes were patented. The studios got together and said, we don't want to pay money to uh, uh, the, these processes anymore. Let's develop rear projection. And so all the studios share the development of rear projection. And so studios often have rear projection shots in the 30s, uh, it's a, their classic way of combining actors uh, with live action scenes, and they did that because they could do that because they owned the process. But occasionally they still went back and, and used both those processes, like on King Kong. Uh, uh, big effects pictures would have to sort of use everything that was available. haven't tired you out yet. <laughs> I'm sorry, me again. <laughs> no, please, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Yeah, um, the, maybe, do you know maybe in the special effect department, as department, at what time, um, or maybe at, in which film, it was the first film, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. Maybe do you know? Um, yeah. Well, I can I can try to answer like 
about special effects departments. If that, if that's the something. very first film, maybe, if you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, um, well, so, so early cinema, you know, so before the establishment of the studio system, you had independent filmmakers with their own studios like Chaplin and Keaton and Lloyd. They had their own studios. Uh, and their own uh, cameramen were responsible for the visual effects. Um, uh, as as motion picture industry grew in Hollywood, they had to consolidate and create bigger companies with sound stages, and then they had departments. So you know, by the late twenties and thirties, there would be an optical department which would have an optical printer to create composites for all the production that would be happening at 20th Century Fox or at MGM or a universal. So those were big departments and they had costuming departments, they had art departments. They were called magic factories so that you could make an entire film uh, at that specific location. So um, the cameraman became less responsible for doing visual effects and that was turned more over to a department where it could be bid and the, the production could then be managed. So uh, all that sort of happened under the studio system and then eventually when the studio system fell apart, kind of in the 50s and the 60s, everything sort of went freelance, and uh, independent visual effects companies uh, sort of took over. In fact, uh, George Lucas wanted to do Star Wars at 20th Century Fox, but their visual effects department couldn't handle it because it didn't really exist anymore, so he had to create his own visual effects company to do that movie, and that sort of relaunched the new renaissance in visual effects. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.